Ah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we're talking about restaurants, restaurants of Hawaii. And we're talking today about the restaurants, rest, some restaurants that have opened now during COVID. Very exciting. And the executive director of the Restaurant Association of Hawaii is uh, Cheryl Matsuoka. She joins us. Hi, Cheryl. So nice to see your smiling face. Always good to be here. Thank you so much for having us. The same. And, uh, and Blaine, Blaine Yoshizawa, uh, he runs a couple of restaurants, and we're happy to have him here, too, because one of those is a brand new restaurant, and we want to explore anything brand new right now. Welcome to the show, Blaine. Thank you. So, uh, Cheryl, maybe you could uh, give us a, an update, okay, on events in the legislature and the kinds of issues that restaurants, the Restaurant Association, for that matter, restaurants in general, are interested in right now in this session. In this session in Hawaii, as you know, our restaurants were hit really badly because of the pandemic. So right now for us to have to deal with the minimum wage question, the unemployment increase, um, Bill 40, which is the plastics bill, um, I can go on and on, Jay. You know, right now is not the time for restaurants to increase their cost of doing business. When we were this last year in such a terrible financial situation where even to this day, you know, even though we are at, um, you know, full capacity because of the six foot distancing, many restaurants are tiny. So they can't even use full capacity because of the six foot distancing. So financially, we don't have the revenue coming in that we, you know, when we do our business plan, we anticipate full dining rooms, right? Lots of activity. So we cannot have any other impacts that is gonna cost us more money during a time where people still are not very actively getting out there. You know, the CDC just put out their new guidelines about now that people are vaccinated, we can try to get back to normalcy, you know, and we're still in Hawaii, we're not there yet. You know, we vaccinated 75 years and older, but at this stage, as of today, March 9th, you know, we're going down, right? So for the 70 years and below that have not been vaccinated, you know, those are the people that we're hoping will get vaccinated so they can come back to our dining rooms. Yeah, the CDC thing should have an effect. It's yes. sort of the light at the end of the tunnel, I hope. Yes. Um, but we all have to remain vigilant, you know? Yesterday we had a show about Aloha Safe. Uh, yes. Aloha Safe is a, is a program using technology from Apple and Google to identify anybody around uh, that you know that might be might have been exposed, uh, and then it'll send you a text message saying you know you want to get checked up. So you have a program on getting checked up on testing. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yes, we were gifted on Oahu. Mayor Blangiardi gifted the restaurant industry and our suppliers. So, you know, a lot of times our suppliers are in our restaurants, they're delivering, they're handing things to us. So we are in contact with them. So it's the restaurant industry. So it's the restaurants and the suppliers, the employees, Mayor Blangiardi has gifted us COVID tests. And so if you have any kind of concern, maybe there was a family member of one of your employees and you just want to take precautions. And normally it's around 125, some medicals cover it, some medical programs don't, but it's free. And so they can contact me at info at hawaiirestaurant.org and I can send them the information. All you got to do is go online, show up with a pay stub and your ID, and it's a free COVID test. See, Cheryl cares about restaurants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and so does Mayor, Mayor Blangiardi. Okay, I'll take that. So, um, you know, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl cares about you too, Blaine. And I do too. I'm, I'm, you know, this is a, this is a state where restaurants are part of the family. You know, it's like Ireland. You know, Ireland has the pubs. Everybody spends all their time in the pubs. The pub is just a restaurant, and they bring their kids and they have games and they talk to each other. It's a community thing, and it's not exactly the same in Hawaii, but it's along the same lines where people spend a lot of time in restaurants as part of their lives. And we've been deprived of that for the past year now. A lot of restaurants have failed. Some of them have hung on. A lot of them have changed the way they do business. We know that, Cheryl and me, because we talk to them all the time here. Um, but let's talk about you. You're you're uh, you're in your own category because you started a brand new restaurant. Can you talk about your old one and how it led to your new one, Blaine? Sure. Uh, well, the old one that I have it's a it's a bar and grill, 
uh, in the Moili area, it's called Osoyani. And um, this year we celebrate six years of being around, which is kind of nice. So I've got to see a lot of ups and downs, a lot of uh, different changes in um, you know, how we operate and how we have to stay in business. But uh, in 2019, the summer of 2019, I was kind of challenged to do a side business uh, with a friend and I thought, oh, I want to do a ramen. And at first it started out as a pop-up idea, which kind of as a joke. So I taught myself how to make ramen and we were doing pop-ups um, at Osuyami and it was popular enough. Uh, we turned it into a lunchtime thing. And then uh, in February of last year, 2020, um, I went looking around kind of jokingly, you know, see if there was any spots open. I could maybe turn this into a brick and mortar and uh, a place popped up uh, in Kamuki. It's the old uh, Kamuki Chop Suey, which uh, has changed hands a, a few times since then, but they were up for sale. So I went to go take a look and I thought it, it would be a great opportunity. But again, this is all pre COVID scare. So we didn't fully grasp what was going to be happening. And we got that set in motion and then uh, COVID hit. <laughs> yeah, well, you're not going to imagine sitting at a table and signing a lease and uh, you say to the, the landlord or the landlord's representative, but can you, can you please uh, include the, the COVID provision? <laughs> and, and he looks at, at you like you lost it because there was no COVID provision. No, <laughs> and even the, in the force majeure, the force majeure provisions that have been in leases for 100 years, you know, they don't cover COVID usually, and so and so you 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 going you're going bare when you when you enter into a lease on the on the evening on the eve of a, of an epidemic a pandemic. So what happened? What happened? Well, for starters, I paid full price. I didn't pay COVID price. <laughs> you didn't know what it was before that then, right? In my so, heart, that hurts me. Oh wow, that was a that was an expensive purchase to to buy out the previous restaurant. But um, in April, you know, they, the, uh, all the paperwork went through, the money went through, and we were in the first shutdown. But we just had to do it, you know? So got in there and actually a few days after getting the keys for um, our current restaurant, uh, we reopened it as a takeout only and just kept going, trying to, you know, build our clientele. Did that work? Was that better than, you know, keeping it closed? Oh, absolutely. I th uh, that was kind of a miraculous thing to happen. I, I know um, COVID has really been terrible and shut down a lot of businesses. But what did happen during COVID was it really reminded locals that they'd like to get out. They like to try new things. They like to support new things. And we were one of those things that kind of popped up during a time where everybody was stuck at home. No one's driving around on the streets. So we were kind of a, a friendly faced new thing. That was comfort food. You know, ramen is, is the new Simon. So Simon, of course, is our, our local comfort food. So being part of that, um, I think it really, strange to say, it, it worked towards our advantage. I don't know if that would have worked out the same if, you know, people were able to go out. But takeouts, um, sales uh, worked out really well for us. People came to try us out more so than I think they would have if we weren't in a pandemic, strangely say. Did you have a place where people could stop, you know, drive their cars and stop and pick up the food? Uh, right in front of the restaurant, there are two, or there was two, um, I guess, drop-off spots. Because we're right next to Surfing Pig across the street from uh, Pipeline bakery on YLI mm -hmm. and there's uh, those little stalls uh, one of them the one in front of surfing pig just got turned into a parklet mm -hmm. they're trying to you know change up kind of key so it's a little more social and, and modern mm -hmm. so there were two stalls in front of us and people could easily pull in grab food drive off but there's also a, a large uh, public parking space behind us oh, lucky. so that worked out really good for us I was you know, just wondering, just looking at you, what, you know, what is your uh, training and background in restaurants? Where did you pick up the skills necessary to run any restaurant? 
And um, I have a follow-up question after you answer that one. Uh, well, I've been working in restaurants for, for quite a while. Uh, I started out at McDonald's when wow. I was out of high school. So I worked there for a little bit. And then I started working at uh, Kyotaru, um, which mm -hmm. is now Gyotaku. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, Cheryl knows. And um, I worked there for about five years. And then I went to go work for David Nagaishi um, at the Ocean House in Shorebird at the Albergue Reef Hotel. And I did that for nine years. Um, in that time, I opened up my first little bar. It was called Station Bar and Grill, or Station Bar and Lounge on Kapiolani. And then I opened Osoyami, and now I have nudes. But I'm not, a, I'm not a cook. I'm a front of the house guy, which is kind of a weird thing. I never worked behind a bar until I owned one. I never worked in a kitchen until I owned one. <laughs> Training my ownership. Yes. <laughs> the stakes are slightly higher that way. You got to do what you got to do, man. You know, like you start off with a plan and then you just kind of roll with the punches. <laughs> So what kind of what kind of uh, attitude does it take to run a restaurant in a pandemic? Um, you gotta you gotta have a good attitude, man. There's there was a, a thing that happened during the pandemic where, you know, and it's still occurring. Everybody on um, unemployment, no one wants to get out of unemployment, mm -hmm. and there's various reasons for that. You know, whether it's uh, the actual income being equivalent or higher than what they were making before, or maybe you live with your grandparents and you don't want to expose them to, you know, possibly getting sick, things like that. But definitely finding employees, um, very, very difficult. And then the employees that we could find uh, also a little more difficult than pre-COVID in terms of, you know, the type of people um, that we are uh, having to employ if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I, but one element there too is that if I'm, if I'm a, a prospective restaurant employee in the time of COVID, I'm gonna be worried about you know, engaging with strangers. I'm gonna be worried about catching the disease. This is especially so before the vaccine and all that. Um, and so did you experience that? Did you experience potential employees or actual employees who were worried and said, look, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather not? Not necessarily. Um, the, the biggest employee issues that we had were people that didn't uh, necessarily qualify for unemployment. And um, I don't mean to talk bad about people because you know, everybody's dealing with their own things in their own lives. Of course. It's definitely not the most committed uh, type of people that we're now having to rely on to employ. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not the best work ethic type of uh, person. So that made it very difficult and then dealing with uh, attitudes and different kinds of uh, situations, that made it very hard. Yeah, human resources are hard anyway, even in the best of times. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, they're your most important resource, the people, and uh, you've got to maintain somehow. So I imagine that you have to be nimble. Um, and you have to be quick and you have to think of new ways to do old things or new things better. Um, did you have that experience of inventing new restaurant systems, new approaches in operating and staffing and, and for that matter, equipping these restaurants, both of them, during the pandemic? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, prior to COVID, we were definitely looking at more of a, a dine-in type of situation. Especially with uh, with the ramen shop, noodles with broth don't really transport. That's why I'm I'm sure anybody who's ever um, gotten ramen, maybe gotten uh, like pho or something like that, mm -hmm. you don't get it to go. That's almost a rule. And Can't you put the liquid in a separate container and so that's, ask the customer? So that's what we do. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, the problem is it's just not the same quality. It's kind of like getting a really um, nicely cooked steak and it's plated and it's worth 50 bucks when you go to Highs 
but you get that same thing and you order it to go and then you eat it on a paper plate. You still, the, the product is the same ish, but there's perception of value. And then there's also with noodles, um, the starchiness in the noodles, it really changes the, the texture. And with rice noodles, like in the pho example, it's really, really obvious. It, the same components, you just take, you know, 10 minutes away from being plated fresh and it's a completely different product. What about, um, you know, cooking it all together as you normally would to prepare it and then sluicing off the, the liquid into a separate container and giving the, the you know, the, the noodles say, um, you know, which, which are cooked already and which are wet, um, but, but they're not sloshing around the liquid. And then you give them two packages and the customer pours the liquid that you took off. He pours it back on the noodles. Would that help? So that's what we already do. That's what most places do. It's, that's a wild guess. How about me? Maybe I should go into the business, eh? You You're should. Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's what everybody does because the liquid with the noodles, it, it starts to degrade the, the quality of the noodle. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also part of the problem. I don't know if you've ever cooked uh, a pot of, say, spaghetti noodles. And then if you don't address it right away, the starches that are on the noodles, then it really just kind of turns it into this block. You know, and so that's the problem that we have. That's the problem that every noodle yeah. with a broth tip place has to deal with. Yeah, every it, minute it counts. Change. Every minute counts. It really, it, yeah, it kind of, <laughs> it, it kind of does. But it, it gets to that point so quickly that it, it almost doesn't matter. So once you get it to go, even if I made it for you right now and then I just put it into those can containers and you took it home and you did five minutes away, it's it's still going to be very very different from if you sat down and I served it to you fresh. So as they used to say in McDonald's, what's the special sauce that, that makes this attractive to a customer? And I assume you've kept your customers, uh, at least in the, in the, new, the noodle shop. Um, uh, what, what, what have you done to you know, keep them? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. Magic, it's magic. <laughs> it's magic. What I found in a lot of uh, the business things that I've done is, you know, there's no recipe for success, right? We, we've got uh, the best intentions. We think we have a good product. We, have a, we think we have a good location. We, have, we think we have some kind of good promotion running or whatever it is. But it's really that, that stroke of luck, that influencer that, that comes in, that um, the little bit of media attention or something you know that just kind of keeps you moving in that direction of positivity as opposed to just becoming stagnant because we've seen great concepts and great locations and great products just utterly fail and uh it's kind of unexplainable sometimes but i've been really lucky so you know yeah. okay we're, we're with you on that uh, <laughs> So, okay, so um, right now we're in a situation you've been able to survive and even, you know, in a, in a modified way, thrive on both of these operations. And uh, that's, that's to your credit and it also to the credit of having some resources, some funding, so that you, you know, you're not hand to mouth. I think that's got to be important for anybody in you know, suffering through a, a crisis like this. But, uh, you know, as Cheryl says, uh, you know, the CDC is making nice affirmative statements. Uh, there are things happening. There's an array of things, you know. It's, it's like your point about success. Uh, at some point along the way, things are going to gel for the public. And they're going to say, I'm really tired of eating gruel at home. I, I want to I have my restaurant life back again. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And they're going to come back. <clears throat> so the question is, Oh, are you going to be ready for them? What are you doing? What will you do to ramp up back to, you know, a more open operation? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I, I think we're already kind of in motion, you know, with us moving into tier three, mm -hmm. uh, what we saw definitely um, in the, in Osoyami was more people coming out, more people feeling safe, you know, we're, we're trying to normalize and, and reopen everything and make people feel like it's okay 
to come back out and to go to restaurants and all these things. So we've seen a, a big drastic move from takeout being the primary source. Uh, for example, at Nudes, we only have six or seven tables um, for seating. And um, so primarily we are a takeout restaurant. We actually run two different restaurants in the same space, whereas a normal restaurant will, will be all dine in and then, oh yeah, you happen to take, take out a few orders here and there. We are now basically running a takeout window with a ton of business and then a small ramen shop that has seven tables. But we are moving in that direction and we can see it where there's less takeout and there's more dine in. People are getting out more, people are, you know, feeling okay about it. And I, I think that's really good, but we're already there, you know, uh, the restaurant is already rolling. So we don't really have to do very much. We're just kind of adjusting how the different employees are kind of working in their stations to focus on more of the takeout or dine-in as opposed to the takeout side. So Cheryl, I have a hard question for you, right? Is, All right. is, 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 are there a lot of blames around? Well, remember the list I shared with you, Jay? Uh, we named a few restaurants that has opened up. You know, Blaine was in a situation where he signed his lease, was ready to roll, and then, of course, the first shutdown and then the second shutdown. But right now, as we discussed, Jay, there's still restaurants opening up even as recent as this month at the Alamoana Shopping Center. There's some new concepts. Restaurants that are here, um, I don't know, Blaine, if you heard, but like Tanaka, Simon opened up at the Ala Moana Shopping Center. So we still have people who are in the restaurant industry still opening up restaurants, Jay. And go figure, even after going through a pandemic, restaurateurs still are opening up more eateries. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in Yiddish, the word is chutzpah. You gotta have chutzpah. Yes. Have nerve. In, in Japanese, it's come on. Yes. <laughs> yes. And Blaine's got it because you know, as a as an experienced you know businessman and restaurateur, he had um, his bar and grill, and then decided to do another concept. But because of the experience that he had for the last six years, right at his first location, that really helped him. And. Um, I see the lines on Wildlife going into his restaurant and they're very busy. The good thing is Blaine has chosen areas that are more supported by our local people. As you know, Jay, there's still restaurants in Waikiki that are still struggling. Even though tourism has slightly come back, it's not at the volume that it used to be. And so Blaine- well, Local very, restaurants are a better bet right now, aren't they? Yeah. In, in the in the residential areas, so Blaine knowing that you know, like in real estate, right? Location, location, location. The locations that he selected, both the Makali and the Kainiki, those residents will support local businesses, and and local people want to support local businesses. Our Hawaii restaurant card, you know, the business holiday card, Jay. Um, that was the second card, not the CARES funded card, but the second card that was funded by local businesses. That one is expiring at the end of March. So you're gonna see me out there again, campaigning to people. If you've got the green holiday card, please spend it in a restaurant. And, you know, it's very different Blaine than the first card because the first card was only CARES fund. So you couldn't put alcohol on it. The second card, the business holiday card, the green one was purchased by corporate money or businesses purchasing it. So that can even have alcohol on it. So you can put alcohol, you can put your tip on it. So my, my new campaign that's gonna be for March is gonna be spend that holiday card because we want the monies to go into our restaurants. Well, luck or not, Blaine, you know, you have, you have um, evidenced a, a kind of philosophical approach, you know, to, to treat it as a, a confluence of, uh, of considerations and vectors and, and, and find luck in there is, it's more than luck. You understand. You've you found an understanding of the business, perhaps. Maybe it's it's the experience in all these other restaurants that make the difference. But now that you have that, now that you've made both of these things go, uh, such as they are, um, what's the future for you? I mean, I, I see in you more restaurants. Do you see in you more restaurants? Uh, it's funny that you say that. 
Uh, I am currently part of a project that's going to be opening up in Hawaiian Brian's, um, okay. maybe at the end of this month or at the very, very first weekend of uh, April. And it's a uh, speakeasy concept. Nice. <laughs> nice. Back to so the future. <laughs> they, uh, so Lucky Belly is involved in that as well. Um, Hawaiian Brian's obviously. And um, it was initially supposed to be Izakaya Tani, which is a, a vegan uh, mm -hmm. Izakaya restaurant on Baratania. Baratania. They're super great. They're, they're the best. But they, they pulled out and I got tagged in last week so <laughs> apparently now i'm developing a, a vegan sushi restaurant concept um oh no project. kidding well you know we have a vegan show you should watch our vegan show on thursday uh, uh, lillian yeah. <laughs> uh, Lil, vegan world and she's been she's had a lot of press and she's very good and she brings in these uh, chefs and and vegan lovers of all kinds and she she talks about dishes, and uh, you got to watch her. You got to meet her. I'll, I'm happy to put you together with her. She's very That's nice. Neat. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah but nudes and osoyami um, both feature vegan foods. You know, almost every single ramen dish that we have at, at nudes is is vegan or can be made vegan as well. So it's it's definitely a field that you know I've been dabbling in the past few years. Well, more popular now than ever. Oh yeah, exactly. people people are getting really sensitive to that issue, and there's, you know, with vegan, there's this, you know, there's no negative to it at all. You're doing the right thing for the right reasons, and having you know a good, you know, health experience too. What are you going to call it, Mike? I'm not. You can, you can share it. Share it with us. It's okay. We'll never <laughs> tell them. We'll never tell a soul. I'm I'm told that that they're calling it a uh, wild orange. Cool. So that's probably the first time anybody said that outside of you know private doors, but yeah, there it is. In a larger okay. sense, uh, <laughs> wanna, uh, okay. In a larger sense, I want to ask both of you the same question to close, and that is, uh, you know, I, I said earlier, and I say actually I say this to Cheryl every time we meet, is that Hawaii is a restaurant kind of place. And what do you see for the for the industry going forward? What you know, I think it's a good point to say. It's moving toward vegan and things like that, health, health foods. Um, but what, what, how do you see it go? You know, coming out of this pandemic, what's it going to be like for us? Not only what's it going to be like, but what are what are we going to do to engage with it and support it? What do you expect? That is a tough question. <laughs> You've got to be thinking about it, Blaine. <laughs> yeah, I can talk a little bit about trends, you know. Yeah, um, okay. So what it is, is you're right, right on the nail, Jay, because of all us baby boomers, and I'm in that category, right? I'm 65. Everyone is I would have at, thought you were 16, but never mind. <laughs> and <laughs> everybody's looking at food as medicine, and especially during a pandemic, and we've all had this terrible health scare, right? Everybody's trying to build up their immunities. And they realize that vegan, as long as it tastes good, some people are like, this is vegan. I can't even believe this. I'm eating something that's vegan until, you know, you just serve it to people and you're like, ha ha ha, you know, you really because I've been to um, that vegan restaurant on Baratania Lane, and it's excellent. I mean, there's sushi and there's sashimi. That's not even sashimi. It's beet on a sushi that you think is sashimi, tastes just like you're eating a, a sushi with sashimi on it, right? right? So I think, Jay, you're right. You're gonna see a lot more vegan restaurants because people are gonna start saying, hey, this tastes great, you know, and it's healthy for me. And as people have more awareness of that food is their, food can, is your medicine, right? You're gonna eat anyway, but you might as well eat healthy and help with your, lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol by eating vegan. I yeah, think you can be, you can have, have eaten all kinds of crummy foods your whole life, but it's not too late no, to it's clean not up too your late. act. It's, <laughs> it's not, not too, too late. late to get healthy. It's never too late. So Blaine, what would you, what would you add to Cheryl's comment? Uh, well, besides uh, people eating healthier, um, when people, when uh, I think when people start coming out, we're, we're going to see a lot more, 
comfort food uh, things like uh, uh, the, the, the Simon spot that took over the old Agu Papa, Papa yeah, Kurt. Papa, Papa Kurt. You know, um, they're not open every day, but they're making a big splash and all they're doing is, is comfort food. And, you know, we have a, like I said, ramen comes from, from Simon and uh, it's a nice little throwback and they're doing really well for themselves. So I, I kind of see a lot of uh, that little retro throwback things, you know, and, and especially with all the, the old time restaurants that have unfortunately closed during COVID time, you know, it's going to be nice to bring them back to life in a way. You know, you mentioned my last point. I, I, I have trouble leaving this conversation. My, my last point uh, goes to something you said about um, not having local restaurants in Waikiki. Do you think there will come a time when people are Akamai, I mean, tourists are Akamai enough uh, to accept local restaurants in Waikiki and to have, you know, really good ones, but local food that may not, that may, may be, uh, you know, unusual for these people to eat, but still, you know, worth presenting to them. You think that'll happen? I think that they're popular. I mean, as you know, the, the I want to say the last show or two shows ago, we talked about how people, when they come to our, our visitors, when they come to Hawaii, on their bucket list is to go to a luau, is to eat Hawaiian food is to try poi, even though they've been told it tastes like wallpaper paste. It's to try, right, the Filipino food, right? It's to venture out and, and go to, you know, eat malasadas and, and do the things that our local, our local uh, residents enjoy. And I, I know that they venture out and they look for that. And it worked, Blaine? Uh, well, I, oh, what she said, I, I'd agree to that. I, you know, um, I don't, I don't think, uh, it's going to be a while, I think, before we have any kind of real local things hitting Waikiki. Yeah. Uh, there's a very kind of, uh, uh, whitewashed, very commercially acceptable type of cuisine that's mm -hmm. in, um, Waikiki right now. And it, it caters to different ethnicities, um, but not necessarily to local culture. Mm. But that kind of works a little bit better for us, though, because you can make people get out of Waikiki to go to yeah. Rainbow. That's a, that's a really go good point. To, to the other side yeah. of the island to go yeah. grab Giovanni's or something like that. You know, so our, our local, local establishments are, are kind of almost better where they are, you know, and it, it makes them special as opposed to they're just really available, you know, when you come down the elevator from your hotel. <laughs> How very thoughtful of you. Thank you for that. I think that's a very worthy point. Uh, Blaine, Cheryl, thank you so much for coming on the show. Always appreciate it. Uh, this is one of my favorite shows and I always enjoy it. And frankly, it always makes me hungry. Um, thank you very much. You're very welcome. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.